Teresa Lewis, her story, her crimes, and her last words. Are you ready for a heart-wrenching story about a woman with a very low IQ who ended up on death row? You're in the right place today as we are diving deep into the very tragic tale of Teresa Lewis. Before we uncover the truth, ask yourself, how much do you think someone's mental capacity should be a factor with their punishment? At 9.13 tonight, 41-year-old Teresa Lewis was put to... Later this evening, Virginia is set to execute a woman. Teresa Wilson, later known as Teresa Lewis, was born into poverty in Danville, Virginia. Her parents worked in a textile mill, and Teresa herself sang in a church choir during her youth. At 16, she dropped out of school and married a man she'd met at the church. The couple had a daughter, Christy Lynn Bean, but the marriage ended in divorce, leading Teresa to struggle with alcohol and painkillers. Her mother-in-law described her as not right. Teresa met her future husband, Julian Clifton Lewis Jr. at the now defunct Dan River Textile Mill. After bouncing between numerous low-paying jobs, she eventually found work at the same mill in 2000, with Julian as her supervisor. Julian, a recent widower with three children, welcomed Teresa and her daughter into his home in June 2000, and they married shortly after. In December 2001, Julian's oldest son, Jason, died in a car accident, leaving his father with $200,000 from a life insurance policy. The money was used to purchase a manufactured home on five acres of land in Pittsylvania County, Virginia. In August 2002, Julian's younger son, Charles J. Lewis, obtained a $250,000 insurance policy as he prepared for deployment to Iraq with the United States Army Reserve. Charles designated his father as the primary beneficiary and Teresa as the secondary beneficiary. Little did they know this decision would set the stage for a tragic turn of events. The crime that shocked the community involved Teresa allegedly hiring two men, Rodney Fuller and Matthew Schallenberger, to kill both her husband and stepson. It was claimed that Teresa promised the killers a share of the insurance money that she would receive after their deaths. On the tragic night of October 30, 2002, Rodney Lamont Fuller and Matthew Schallenberger broke into the Lewis home with a terrible plan. Teresa's husband, Julian Clifton Lewis Jr., was shot many times by the intruders in a violent attack. Her stepson, Charles J. Lewis, was also shot while he was asleep, not knowing what had happened. The peaceful home turned into a horrible crime scene in just a few minutes. During the chaos, Teresa called 911 and told the operator about the break-in and the shootings. She seemed like a scared wife and stepmother asking for help, but when the police arrived, they started to feel suspicious about her behavior. While looking into the situation and collecting information, police noticed some problems with Teresa's story about what had happened that night. Her story seemed practiced and was missing important details, which made the investigators very suspicious. They also thought her behavior was odd because she didn't seem to be very upset or sad about her husband and stepson being killed so violently. These observations made the police think that Teresa might have had more to do with the crime than she had admitted. Further investigation led to the discovery of a series of letters exchanged between Teresa and the killers detailing their plans. In these letters, it was evident that Teresa was involved in the planning and had even given the men $1,200 to purchase the murder weapons. Prosecutor says she used sex and cash to pay the two men. But complicating the case, Lewis did not pull the trick. Additionally, Teresa was caught trying to withdraw money from Julian's bank account the day after his murder. During the trial, it was revealed that Teresa had engaged in a romantic relationship with both Fuller and Schallenberger. The prosecution argued that her motive for orchestrating the murders was not only the insurance money, but the desire to continue her relationships with the two men. Teresa's defense focused on how her low IQ of around 70 indicated a limited mental capacity. Her attorneys argued that she was more vulnerable and easily manipulated due to her intellectual disability. Some believe that she may not have fully understood the consequences of her actions leading to her involvement in the terrible crime. Critics of her trial and conviction claimed that Teresa's associate, Fuller and Schallenberger, were sentenced to life in prison while Teresa was sentenced to death, given the fairness of her trial. 
Teresa Lewis's last meal included two fried chicken breasts and buttered sweet peas, pepper and apple pie for dessert. On the day of her execution, she reached out to her stepdaughter, Kathy Lewis Clifton, who had witnessed the event, and apologised to her for the murder of her brother and father. I'm so sorry, said Teresa, I just wanted you to know. Teresa was executed at the Greensville Correctional Center near Jarrett, Virginia. In her final hours, she spent time in prayer and hymn singing. Death was pronounced at 9.13 p.m. She was executed on September 23, 2010 at 9 p.m. with a lethal injection. She became the 12th woman to be executed in the United States since the death penalty was reinstated in 1976. Teresa's execution was the first time a woman had been executed by lethal injection in Virginia. It has been almost a century since the state executed a woman named Virginia Christian, who died in the electric chair in 1912. Teresa was also the first woman executed in the United States since Frances Newton was executed in Texas in 2005. After her execution, Teresa Lewis was cremated. Her case continues to raise questions about the treatment of people with intellectual disabilities in the criminal justice system and the appropriateness of the death penalty in such circumstances. She only has an IQ of 72, just two points above the legal minimum. Teresa's functional mental age is in the range of 12 to 14 years. As society continues to grapple with the ethics and morality of capital punishment, this case is a stark reminder of the potential pitfalls and biases that can exist in the legal system. Her supporters stressed the importance of assessing each case individually, taking into account the special circumstances of the accused and ensuring that the sentence is appropriate for the crime. She looked quite scared. Um, she looked a little nervous. It's a, a terrible, appalling thing to execute uh, Teresa Lewis. Protesters gathered outside the Greensville Correctional Center in Jerry. And I think people need to remember her victims and not her. Furthermore, it highlights the need for continued discussion and debate around the use of the death penalty to ensure fair and equal application of the law. In summation, Teresa Lewis's story is a cautionary tale that invites us to reflect on the complexity of the US legal system and the ethical considerations surrounding the use of the death penalty. This makes us question whether the death penalty is a fair and reasonable form of punishment, especially in cases involving vulnerable people. Ultimately, it serves as a call to action for a more compassionate and just approach, encouraging society to engage in critical dialogue about the effectiveness and the ethics of the death penalty. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and share it with your friends. And why not subscribe and press the bell icon so you can keep up to date with all the latest that we have.